Because future-looking statements are inherently subject to risk and uncertainty, our reminder is that you should make any purchasing decisions or investment decisions based on products that are currently commercially available. Hello, and welcome to the Developer Ask the Expert session here today at DreamTX. We are so excited to be bringing you answers to all the questions that I'm sure you've got ready for us in the chat already. So a couple of notes. First, please make any and all purchasing decisions based on what's currently available on the platform and not any forward-looking statements that I or my wonderful panelists today may make. We might be making some, so just keep that in mind. Second, make sure you're putting all of your questions for us in the chat. I have experts here today from Functions, Apex, APIs, and tooling. So we want to hear your questions. We want them in that chat. We're super excited. And without any further ado from me, your host, Heather Storm, Developer Program Manager here, I'd like to have my panelists introduce themselves, but not just themselves and what they work on, also their oldest piece of swag. So let's start with Chris Harrison. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Harrison. I'm a product manager on Salesforce platform, and I'm responsible for our core data APIs, so breast and bulk. Um, I haven't been at the company for very long, so my oldest piece of swag is from last year's Dreamforce, which is a t-shirt I had staffing a booth. So I thought it'd be appropriate for this session. <laughs> awesome. I love that. I think I have that t-shirt up in my closet as well. <laughs> mm. It's very right. comfortable. Uh, so Stephanie, let's go over to you. Tell us a little bit about you. Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Maddox. I am a product manager on the platform developer tools and experiences team. I own the core VX code extensions and some other related tools. My oldest piece of swag, I've been around a while. Um, I came from exact target days. So subscribers rule our old uh, icon. I think that's my oldest t-shirt that I've got around. Love it. All right, and Chris Peterson. Yeah, hi everyone. Chris Peterson, Director of Product Management. Uh, I own Apex as my day job, but I've also been doing some work helping with Salesforce functions, especially around Apex invocation of functions and similar things like that. Um, my oldest piece of swag is actually a hand-me-down through the long line of Apex product managers. At one point, Apex had a very retro logo, and there are still a few stickers in existence from those old days. Awesome. So we've got an old t-shirt. Uh, actually, two old t-shirts and an old logo, and I also have a, an old piece of Dreamforce swag. I've got a little water bottle here. Um, so we're really celebrating the past and present and future of Salesforce together here today. So let's dive into some of your questions because I'm already seeing them come in on the chat. And Stephanie, I actually wanted to start with you. Um, I have seen um, SQL Query Builder, I think earlier in the welcome session. I'm wondering, when can I get my hands on that? You can get your hands on it right now. It's already out there. Um, so SQL Builder, for those that aren't aware, is an extension for VS Code that lets you write SQL queries. Um, you can visually see your fields. You can see the query syntax as it builds. And then you can execute that query right in VS Code. So you can see the results, letting you check your work or get an answer to a quick question. You can also download those results to JSON or a CSV. So it should be a great time saver. Um, as I mentioned, it's out on the VS Code Marketplace today. Um, that is separate from the extension pack. It's still in beta. We've still got a lot of work to do, but would love for you to check it out and help give us feedback of how we should do the rest of it. So yeah, just check it out on the extension marketplace. You can install it and start using it today. Cool. And I think you have a session later today too that dives into more of that. So stay tuned for the developer tooling session later this this. Uh whatever time of day it is for you. <laughs> um, all right, so Chris Harrison, mm. is it true Select Star is now available in SQL? That's false. Oh, well, um, is there anything that you can tell us? I can, I can tell you what is true. Um, okay. <clears throat> what is great. true, <laughs> yeah, in, uh, in spring 21, we're shipping a new function within SQL called fields. And that will allow folks who are writing a SQL statement to express the equivalent of select star, but a whole lot more. Um, this is a new function that has wonderful extensibility and will allow for 
the inclusion of predefined groupings of fields to be submitted to a SQL query. So another convenience uh, feature on the platform to make writing SQL statements easier for developers and admins alike. Um, and it's something that we'll add more capability to in future releases to really take advantage of um, other platform constructs that uh, can be leveraged directly in SQL. So stay tuned, more to come in the future, um, but in spring 21, writing SQL statements is gonna be a lot simpler. Yeah, so SQL fields, check it out. It's gonna be really awesome. <laughs> yeah. Cool, all right. And then I have a question for you, Chris Peterson. Um, what is new with asynchronous Apex? I know we have a session later today, but I've noticed the transaction finalizer, finalizers have been in pilot for a while. And do you have any announcements that you can make about what the roadmap looks like for this? Yeah, I think I uh, stole the wind out from under your sails by tweeting a sneak peek about the release notes, but they are finally going to an open beta in this release. So that means you can package them, you can use them in any organization. They are still applied only to Qable. Um, we're looking at expanding that to other contexts in the future, but previously they were scratch org only. You can now use them anywhere. Uh, we have the beta label on there because given the complexity of the feature, it's deserializing Apex objects between contexts that are otherwise independent, which is something fairly novel. We expect that there'll be some edge case bugs. So we wanted to give it a warning for customers who are very risk averse, that they probably want to hang tight another release while the, the last of the edge case bugs get worked out by early adopters. But we took the limits off. You can use it just with the normal beta disclaimer attached to it. And we're expecting to GA the next release after that. So assuming nobody finds anything really interesting, it should be ready for everybody shortly. Awesome, that's really exciting. Okay, cool. So I have a couple questions that have come in live now that I'm really excited about. So this first one, um, Chris, it builds off of the earlier question about fields. So does fields in SQL automatically imply with security enforced? Yeah, if you um, use fields in uh, a REST uh, query submission or so um, field level security is automatically uh, applied. It's really just a, a way to substitute in a predefined grouping of fields to ex essentially expand out um, the eventual statement that would be submitted to the server. In APEX, um, there are some limitations and, and um, restrictions with if and when you can use and how you can use that feature in its initial GA state. So I'm gonna tag in Chris Peterson to expound upon um, what security enforced and, uh, and how that would play along. Yeah, I actually asked Chris not to allow select star, like unbounded field sets in Apex, because one of the things we wanted to avoid was an admin creating a new field and suddenly Apex that used to work starts failing with query too complex, too many foreign key relationships. The backwards compatibility and robustness that we target for Apex that saved your org meant that open-ended queries like that were a little bit higher risk than we wanted. So we don't allow the select all fields unbounded expressions in there. Uh, but your question was really about security. Does it imply with security enforced? No, because there's probably tons of use cases where you want system mode. A whole bunch of the community's security model is built around using system mode to elevate permissions for trusted business operations at this point. And if we always implied with security enforced, you wouldn't be able to use that in conjunction with fields. Um, I do have something coming up that'll be a pilot coming soon that we'll be announcing more formally once we have exact dates and content where we're doing the next generation of security for Apex. So FLS and CRUD, um, it's called user mode database operations, which is actually allowing you to drop into normal user mode, like what API calls and things like that use, not Apex's system mode for specific database operations. So realistically long-term, I don't want Chris to build special features for Apex. I want his features to work exactly as they should and we'll layer on Apex security context to wear features as they make sense for that context. Brilliant. That sounds like a robust plan for the future. And thank you for giving us that answer that right now, nope. But uh, we're, we're going to continue to work on those different security features. Yeah. And you absolutely can use with security enforced in the same query you're using fields. It's just not implied. It's just not implied. Right. Perfect. Yeah. You may want to use uh, strip and accessible for graceful degradation. We don't want to be too opinionated about your security model because they span a wide spectrum of use cases. Totally. 
All right. So Stephanie, I'm seeing a couple of questions come in about org dependent unlock packages. And I also have seen that a lot of people are nervous about just diving in until it's GA. So when are org dependent unlocked packages GA? Yeah, that's a great question. And let me first explain what they are, because that can seem like a bit of a mouthful and maybe sounds a little bit scary. So org dependent unlock packages allow you to start breaking up your metadata into packages and get some of the benefits of faster development there. But it can still be dependent on metadata that's not packaged in your org. So if you think about if you have a large org and lots of things to untangle, that can feel pretty daunting. So org dependent unlock packages gives you a way to contain and group some of your metadata, get some benefits there while not having to untangle everything and you can kind of have some dangling things. And that is targeting for GA pretty early next year. It's we're targeting spring. Okay, cool. Uh, spring sounds Solid. <laughs> All right. So I have another question here. Um, this is for Chris Peterson. Are there any plans to improve the ability to run Apex unit tests in parallel? So yes and no. The no is during metadata deployments, we have a pretty fundamental constraint, which is atomic database transactions. It's kind of the foundation of a huge part of the platform and just modern computer science around database management means that your transactions are isolated from each other until they commit. So when you do a metadata deploy, you have a database transaction that has a boatload of metadata already pending, but not committed. So other database connections can't see it. So we only have a single database connection that has your new metadata staged that we can run tests against. So that's a pretty hard limit that we can't get past unless we wanted to do a parallel deploy of your metadata, but that gets really expensive. It doesn't scale very well. So we aren't planning to do anything serious around parallelization during metadata deployments, just because we can't given those constraints. Um, there are other options that I would suggest like using second generation packaging. So you front load the testing cycle and don't do it as part of your release. I think that's more optimal in that case. Um, but more generally, are we planning to improve Apex unit tests in parallel? Yes, but it's probably about a year out before we start doing serious work on that. Um, we are seeing the gaps in the unit testing system for Apex. Like, It doesn't differentiate effectively between unit tests and integration tests. Unit tests, we should parallelize aggressively. Integration tests, we shouldn't because of row locks and other database resources. So we do need to iterate on the test system and make it more opinionated and aware of these things um, and some quality of life improvements around them. So it's longer term. I haven't put it on my roadmap slides officially yet because we need to finish what's on our plate, but it's coming at some point. Okay, brilliant. All right, Chris Harrison, I have a question for you. Um, people are really excited about the new enhancements with the composite graph API, but we've also mm -hmm. heard recent announcements around GraphQL. And so we just wanna clear the air for everyone. Can you tell us what the difference is between the composite graph API and GraphQL? Sure. Uh, composite graph is a core REST API and it's purpose built to interact with S objects records. Um, GraphQL is a query language, an open source query language, a runtime uh, that allows for querying uh, and sometimes manipulation of data against uh, a set of predefined schemas. Um, so GraphQL is something that Salesforce is exploring to uh, improve the developer experience for those who are building front end experiences. Um, Composite Graph is a new addition to our extensive family of REST resources and is you know, well suited for integrations that are already uh, leveraging that architectural pattern. Um, the, the term graph uh, in the context of this composite API is that the payload is uh, comprised of graphs of S objects endpoints that allow you to you know, more efficiently and effectively manage CRUD operations on core data records. Um, and so the graph is comprised of uh, sub requests of endpoints that you can stitch together and avoid a lot of uh, custom code to, you know, manage the orchestration of a set of related calls. So they, 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 they solve similar types of problems, but they do so in um, very, uh, specific ways um, in that you can, there's a lot of flexibility to, to bring together 
uh, related data or operations together, but um, they're they're pretty distinct and and different types of architectures. Definitely. I'm really excited about what we're doing with the Composite Graph API. And thank you for championing that because I think that's really going to change uh, things for people. All right. So we've got um, not a ton of time to answer another question right this minute, but guess what? We're going to stay on. So after the quick break where we're going to go talk to principal admin evangelist Jillian Bruce, she's going to give us another update on what's happening with the scavenger hunt. You're also going to hear from one of our trailblazers. So stay tuned for that. Check that out and then come back here. Keep those questions coming in the chat. We are definitely, we've got a lot more to talk about. We're really excited about it. Um, so stay tuned with us. But definitely take a quick break, go hang out with Jillian, and then come back here and we'll, we'll finish this out with 17 more uh, minutes of amazing answers to all of your questions. All right, welcome back to the Developer Ask the Expert session. Hopefully you returned in earlier, but in case you weren't, a couple of reminders. My name is Heather Storm. I'm a Developer Program Manager here, and I'm your host. And I am joined by three amazing panelists. I've got Chris Peterson here to talk about all things Apex and some small things functions. I've got Stephanie Maddox here, who's going to tell us a little bit more about tooling and answer all your tooling questions. And I've got Chris Harrison here to answer all of your API questions. <laughs> um, quick note before before we dive into those questions, in case you missed it earlier, please make any and all purchasing decisions based on what's currently available on the platform and not any forward-looking statements that we may make. All right, enough of that. Let's dive back into your questions because I've already seen them coming in. Keep them coming in the chat. I have a question. Let's start uh, with this one. Is there going to be a better way to get all components for package XML that will be used for Salesforce CLI deployments? Stephanie, that's for you. Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm assuming this is this is kind of um, you know being able to construct your your package.xml and and not totally certain if you have everything or if you don't. This is something we're thinking about for next year. Um, we've explored kind of a, a package builder, if you will, that lets you see all of the metadata you have and then be able to visually construct that. Right now, you have to just do that in code with your package.xml. And sometimes that can leave you feeling a little uncertain if you have everything. So we are thinking about some visuals on that. You'll see a spec on our GitHub repo um, coming from me in, in the coming weeks. So we post, I suppose, post specs out there for tooling, especially in the VS Code extension. So that's a great way for you to, to weigh in on the actual spec we're going to build and give us feedback and tell us if that's going to meet your needs or if you have some other ideas before we even build it. Cool, and that's a great shout out too to the fact that we've open sourced a lot of our tooling and you can go see those specs. So that's on the, the Salesforce, what repo? <laughs> yeah, everything is under force.com where it's all spelled out. You see all of our repos under that. Um, VS Code has been, our extensions have been open sourced from the start and the CLI team has done a ton of work this year to start open sourcing that code as well because Lots of you have asked to inspect and see that code and maybe extend it and do some other things with that. So you see the start of the CLI being broken up and you see different libraries and repositories out there as well that you can get your hands on. We firmly believe in building in the open. So you'll see that trend continue. We are committed to, to building in the open that gives you flexibility to see our tools, extend them, do other things with them. And also, if you're so inclined, submit a, submit a PR. If there's a change that, that you want and it's something that makes sense for other customers, We've had over 30 different PRs for the VS Code extensions this year. We really appreciate the help. So keep them coming and check out our repos, give us feedback, submit PRs. We would love for you to be involved. Brilliant, cool, all right. So the next question I've got, um, this one is for Chris Harrison. So uh, people are wondering, you know, we've been talking a lot about Open API 3.0 spec for um, specifically S object, and people are wondering what's the difference between Open API 3.0 and RAML for our REST APIs. Mm. So um, I like to think about the two specifications playing well together for the API landscape. Um, the TLDR is, you know, RAML is well suited for API producers, um, teams that are designing and building a new API. And open API specifications are great for API consumers who want to learn about how an API works and incorporate 
the industry standard specification into their development life cycle. So um, on the Open API 3 side, uh, we recognize that our extensive ecosystem of REST APIs uh, would be well served to be described with this industry standard. So we're working on uh, that very uh, that very thing. There is actually some great programming uh, today uh, that demonstrates the the value that such a specification can offer for different uh, different personas in the developer experience. Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, with respect to Raml, you know people build custom APIs on our platform through Apex REST. And we're exploring how we might uh, harness that specification to uh, to really accelerate uh, that aspect of, of development and customization on the platform. So that's something I continue to partner with Chris Peterson on uh, so that we do so with the full uh, purview of how Apex is expressed out uh, as REST endpoints. And there's also a really good blog um, by the MuleSoft team. If you do some searching for RAML, OpenAPI, MuleSoft, you'll connect to a blog from a few years ago that really talks about how these are two great tastes that taste great together. Awesome. Oh, that's that's wonderful. You know, what I've really loved about this so far, this is just a random comment. I love how much all of you collaborate with each other <laughs> and you're calling out like, oh, I do this thing for Apex or oh, I do this thing for APIs or this is how this works with the tooling. Like, it's just great to see all of this coming together. So thank you for answering all these questions. Okay. I have another question that's come in and we actually don't have an expert on the call for this one. And I just wanted to quickly address it. Uh, somebody's asked what cool things are coming to Lightning Web Components. And I have good news, even though I don't have an expert right now, there is a session later today that will go over some really cool stuff coming to LWC, especially around styling hooks, which is my favorite thing, but also some security enhancements and a bunch of other stuff. So definitely be sure to check out that episode later um, and, and keep your questions coming. We're gonna do our best to answer them. Okay, so the next question I have, um, doo -doo -doo. let's see here. I've got a question for Stephanie. Um, and this, we might not have a good answer for it, but we can try. So we have a Salesforce CX plugin and Visual Court Studio Code extensions, and customers are asking when we'll be able to provide the CLI plugin as a signed plugin. Do you have any updates? Okay, I'm not sure if that's referring to a specific CLI plugin from Salesforce or I'm not sure. Um, either. We do have a couple of CLI plugins out there that are still in beta and have not gone through the, the final process for those to be signed. You can expect our plugins at, at GA are, are generally officially signed and mm -hmm. um, by Salesforce. Things built by customers would not be. Um, so uh, feel free to, to email me that question, smatix at salesforce.com and, and happy to answer it. I'm not, not sure I'm totally getting the gist of that one. So feel free to hit me up, happy to answer that one one-on-one. -on -one. Brilliant, yeah, I know a couple of people have asked something similar. So definitely reach out to Stephanie and we'll get you the right answer. Okay, um, Chris Peterson, I've got a question that just came in. Can we get transaction finalizers for other things than queuables? Yes, someday is going to be my answer. Um, so a little bit about how that works under the hood is that we're currently using something that's specific to our message queue system for invoking the finalizers. And for other places, we don't necessarily have that same hook. So we'd have to do some substantial redesigns. Um, if we look at something like LWC, where there's already box carring of actions, we wanted to avoid making your actions take longer on the server while the finalizer runs. And so we don't really have a great place to stick them. We're gonna to have to figure out exactly how to do that. And that'll end up being something like lower limits for the finalizers because they're running synchronously. And so we really need them to be very lightweight or it, there may not be a place where we can realistically attach them when we get down into the details. So for right now, the architecture we have works really well for async, but less well for sync. Um, so the question then becomes, would we apply them to batch apex and tweet at me if you disagree. I'm sure I'll regret saying that. But for batch Apex, we have batch Apex error event. If you add the marker interface for database raises platform events, any unhandled exceptions in your batch job will fire a platform event. And we think that that's a better solution for that because for queuable jobs, the scope is whatever you define it to be. It's effectively arbitrary code. And we don't have any special insight into what it's doing or what it should be doing. It's just run my thing. 
for Batch Apex, where we're managing the scope, we thought it was important to include things like the scope that's actually included, be it Apex with a custom iterator or a, a, a large scale query, and we're passing in a set of records. So Batch Apex error event gives you something that is more insightful at the framework level, but less recovery actions, um, because it tends to be a more prescriptive framework. So we think there, that, that that's really the only place that finalizers make sense for async is unqueable. but uh, yeah, let me know if you disagree. And awesome. someday on sync, we'll get there. It's just probably gonna be a little while because it has a whole bunch of fun engineering challenges. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so this next question, I'm hoping we have an answer for Chris Harrison. Is there any word on a replacement for API Explorer? Mm. Word. Mm. The word <laughs> is stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned, okay, um, great. <laughs> yeah, I think the team learned a lot about uh, that, um, that pilot experience that was driven by uh, API specifications. Um, and so, the team is collecting the learnings and is going to uh, reflect on how we build a, a, a more exciting and uh, useful uh, way to help developers discover and learn about these API capabilities that are powered by the representing API specifications. So my team is working on making sure that the APIs that we own are described with an, API, an open API specification, but we're also connecting with the teams that own uh, various distribution or discovery touch points so that they show up in a useful and meaningful way. So um, that's a, a big effort across the company. So what I would say is stay tuned. We learned what we needed to learn and we're going to cast that forward to um, uh, a really great experience. Okay, brilliant. All right, Stephanie, I've got a quick question for you. Might not actually be quick. Are there any plans to enhance the Apex intelligence and language interpretation in the VS Code Salesforce extensions? We're specifically looking for more help with uh, errors on things like request context for REST requests. Cool. Yeah, we are continuing to iterate on the code completion and intelligence for Apex. Um, I don't think we have that specific scenario accounted for. So I would love for you to, to check out the repo and submit some more details on that. But this is an area that we've been iterating on this year. One area that, that people have, have a hard time with is when you have a really large project, sometimes you're not getting all of that code smartness and all your, your code completion and things that you, that you want. So we've been focused there and are continuing to improve that. So we're, we keep evolving that we will still be evolving it next year, but that exact scenario, I, I don't think that we have, but I'll have to check. Okay. No worries. Um, I'm also just seeing a question and it's not entirely related to developers, but I feel like we should answer it. Um, they really appreciate the process and effort that's been going into some of the architect guides, which I don't know if you've all seen the architect decision guides, but you should definitely check them out. Useful for architects, devs, and admins alike. And they're wondering if there are plans for more of those. And I have an announcement. We do have a new one, it just launched today. Um, so check out the Architect channel. Um, it's all about uh, deployment, which I think is really relevant to a lot of the things that we've been talking about for tooling today with Stephanie. So highly recommend you go check that out. Um, lots of great things coming for Architects as well. So check out the Architect channel at some point today. Uh, although we love the developer channel too. So there's lots of good stuff coming today. <laughs> all right. So I think we've got time for maybe two more questions if we make them quick. Um, so let's see here. Chris Peterson, are there any plans to add file folders to Apex to aid in organizing an org? Yes, and no. Um, so the no is I don't have any concrete plans to do anything on the Salesforce server side for, for adding this. I, there is a longstanding dream that we would love to have true foldering in the form of modules that apply not just to code, but any type of metadata, but it keeps turning out to be really expensive and the opportunity cost is kind of staggering. So probably not, if I'm being honest, um, you know, it's always on the table for discussion, but probably not. What has happened is with the SFDX project source format, you can put Apex code in any folder you want, or even across multiple projects for organizational purposes. 
but the name still has to be unique and it gets deployed to Salesforce as kind of a flat model in terms of the actual Apex class metadata. So for pure organizational purposes, use SFDX, use source format. Uh, in fact, the Apex Recipes project is a great example of breaking down into logical units, but you still do have the fundamental constraint that names have to be unique. Okay, cool. All right, Stephanie, I think we've got one last question for you. Where are we with packaging batch, batch Apex errors event triggers? We'd love to include them in the package, but batch error is limited without it. That one's gotcha. for me. Oh, yeah, it? okay. <laughs> it might actually be the Apex I was like, I, I just, question. I was like, I just had my team <laughs> demo that when we closed the story. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, we figured out how to do that with some help from the Platform Events team. They did some legwork for us. We took advantage of it. And in uh, Spring 21, they can now be packaged. So yeah, your batch Apex error event triggers, if you're an ISV, you can now package them in Spring 21. I'm aware of no constraints or meaningful limitations. If you find one, let me know and I'll work with you on it. Okay, brilliant. Love the fast answers. So uh, let's see here. I have another question. Um, Stephanie, this one's for you. I've he heard of org dependent packages, but I'm really confused. I'm not doing package based development currently. So are org dependent packages useful to me? I would say yes, they are. So the the beauty of org dependent packages is you can group some of your metadata together. So if you think about kind of a, a chunk of your org that logically goes together, you can package that together, be able to have tests, have all of that contained and get some faster development without having to kind of untangle everything. So it's a good place to dip your toe in if you're if you're not sure that you want to cleanly package everything into discrete bundles that are completely separate. This still gives you the option to put some of those things together in a package, get some faster development out of it without having to untangle everything. Cool. That sounds awesome. I know untangling an org can be quite complicated, so nice that we have an option to do that in segments now. Um, all right, well, I think that's probably the last question we can get to. I'm not seeing too many more come in, but thank you all for coming and hanging out with us today. Hopefully you're enjoying your Dream TX experience here on day four, Trailhead Day. There's lots more goodness coming in the developer, admin, architect, partner, and learning and community channels. So I highly recommend you check out everything if you can, um, but hang out with us, keep your uh, questions and comments coming in. We're gonna be helping moderate the chat all day long. So thank you so much, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your Dream TX.